today, whoever you are, wherever you are, you can always freely connect, collaborate and share with anyone via the web. Hi, I'm Robert Shaw, a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University studying human-computer interaction and a co-founder of the touchscreen startup technology, uh, Kixo. Today, I'm going to talk about the future of computing, or more specifically, what we might be interacting with our devices like in five to 10 years. But before I get into that, we need to talk about where computing started, where it's come from. This here is the ENIAC, it's widely considered the birth of electronic computing. In 1947, it could do a grand total of 5,000 calculations per second while filling an entire room. In just a few decades, computers went portable. And when computers became portable, it changed how we used computers and also how we viewed them as tools. And this evolution has happened again more recently with the advent of the modern smart device. Today, we have super powerful, yet super small smartphones that we carry around in our pockets. We can look up directions, make reservations, read the news, and a million other actions with incredible ease. And so as you all know, this evolution has been made possible by the enormous increases in computing factors over time. We've managed to attain exponential increases in every technical aspect of computing. Processing power, disk storage, communications bandwidth, screen resolution, and so on. And that's culminated in incredible devices, such as today's modern smartphone and iPhone 5S. So who here, show of hands, carries an iPhone 5S? Shei Shouji, you own the iPhone, Qin Zhishou. OK, so pretty, pretty good number of people. Did you know, if you took that phone back in time to 1993, it would be the third fastest computer on the entire planet. And now you just carry that around with you in your pocket. In point of fact, such a phone and similar smartphones today would have beat out machines like this CM5 supercomputer. These were the kinds of computers that the US government used back in 1993 for incredibly complex nuclear simulations. In fact, it is very likely that in this room today, with 1,400 of you here, we have more processing power here than all the computers combined in China in 1993. Just think about that for a moment. More processing power in this room than an entire country did 20 years ago. And in fact, even the most populous country in the world. And not only have they gotten faster, but we've actually managed to pack that computing power into smaller, cheaper, and more power efficient devices. OK, so you're thinking, Maybe if we follow those trends out in just a few years, well, we could make this. Well, OK, we could build that. We have the technology to, but we haven't. And there's a very good reason why. To understand this, we have to look at human factors. People don't improve like computers do. We adapt to new technologies, but fundamentally, there are just some things about us that don't change. Well, our fingers aren't getting smaller, our eyes aren't getting better, and so on and so forth. So when we design ways to interact with computers then, we have to keep the human factors firmly in mind. Since we can't improve the human, let's improve the human interface. OK, so here's what the state of the art is today for computer interaction. It's touch. This is the most popular way to interact with your devices today. And it's gone mainstream because of its simplicity and its intuitive interactions. It's pretty great. But if you look at this video, you'll see there's something missing here. So what's wrong with this picture? Well, first of all, look at what we're actually doing with the screen. We're just poking at it. One, maybe two fingers on the screen, just poking and prodding around. This is nothing like how we use our fingers in the real world. And second of all, well, look at the size of that screen. Having a screen you can fit into your pocket is really nice. But at the same time, it's clearly too small for many of the interactions that we really want to do. Links are very small, keyboards are cramped, and interaction is confined to the little screen. So today, I'll show you two ways we can evolve from here. One, to enrich devices with richer touch interaction. 
and two, to break interaction free of small screens and displays. So first up, let's look at how we can evolve beyond multi-touch and into the realm of interactions I call rich touch. Think about all the incredible things our hands do every day. Pinching and scratching, rubbing and grasping, flicking and knocking, it's almost endless. Our hands are very, very powerful with such a rich range of abilities. So why should touch screens be limited to just poking? Our hands can do better, and so should touch screens. The richness of mobile interaction has been improving for some time now. Our earliest devices had simple buttons. Later, we moved to stylus and single-touch interaction. And most recently, we've embraced multi-touch and the fluid interactions that that enables. So when multi-touch was popularized around six years ago, primarily with the release of the iPhone, it was transformative to the industry and our lives. But now, it's 2013, almost 2014, six years on, and we're still firmly in the multi-touch era. Not a lot has changed since the release of the iPhone in 2007, and we're still poking, pinching, and swiping at our phones. So I believe we're on the eve of a new kind of touch interaction, which I call rich touch. That is, not just counting the number of fingers on the screen, which is pretty much what multi-touch does, but actually trying to capture more of the rich dimensions of touch. So to help convey what this will mean to the users, I want to show you two of my research projects. My first project draws its inspiration from the use of real-world tools. I call the system touch tools. The average person skillfully manipulates a wide variety of tools, from wrenches to brushes and scissors to hammers. We use these tools in the real world to augment our human capabilities. So why should we only have the poking tool in the touch world? Let's bring the people's familiarity and effectiveness with ordinary tools to empower and enrich touch interaction. And so with touch tools, users touch the screen as if they were holding a tool. Touch tools figures out which tool they wanted and summons a virtual interactive tool for the user. These virtual tools behave similarly to their real-world versions, allowing users to perform similar tasks. Note here, here how I hold the eraser. If I hold it the same way on the screen, I get a little eraser. And you can say it behaves the same way as a real eraser would. Same thing with a mouse. I can click, move my cursor precisely, and zoom in and out. And now, with this, with, uh, I can do the same with a camera. With a virtual camera, I can actually zoom in, zoom out, and take a picture. Touch tools brings the rich, familiar nature of physical tools into our touchscreen realm. And in doing so, it enriches the touchscreen experience. Look at how I can summon all of these tools just by changing my grasp. I don't need any toolbars or buttons to use these functions. All of that power is in my hands. So to build touch tools, I had a number of people just touch the screen the way they'd hold a tool. You can see some of the samples we collected here. We, caught, we collected a whole bunch of those samples, and then we taught the computer to recognize them using machine learning. Touch tools doesn't need any extra hardware to be on a standard touch screen, which makes it very simple to add to an existing tablet or phone. OK, so besides grasping tools, how else do people change the mode of their hands? One way is to use different parts of the hand. We'd never knock on someone's door by touching or poking it. We'd use our knuckles. My second rich touch project, FingerSense, detects how a touch screen is being touched. It can distinguish what part of a finger you touch the screen with, whether you touch the screen with the pad of your finger, the nail, or the knuckle. It's also multi-touch. Finally, it can distinguish a passive stylus and eraser. So that's five different kinds of things that it can distinguish, whereas most existing touch screens can only do one or maybe two. Finger sense can be used in many ways to augment the touch screen experience. So for example, in this photo app, you can open photos as normal, but if you tap with your knuckle, you get a menu. It's just like right click on the computer, but for touch screens. Right click's really useful on desktop computers, and FingerSense brings that to our touch screens. And you see in this finger painting app, we can draw thick lines with a brush, thin lines with a stylus, erase with the eraser, and then smudge using our finger. We can do all of those things without buttons or toolbars. And finally, you see, selecting and editing text on a touch screen is pretty hard because there's really only one input mode. With FingerSense, you can select text with your knuckle, making text selection very, very easy. 
And finally, it becomes very easy with FingerSense to edit and share your photos. Simply knuckle-drag to select part of the image, and you can copy and share it. Again, we don't need any toolbars, menus, or extra buttons to do this. We just need your fingers. So how does FingerSense work? Basically, it uses the sound of the touch impact to classify the touch type. As you can imagine, tapping the screen with the pad of the finger sounds a lot different than tapping it with a nail, for example. FingerSense captures the, tap, the tap sound from an acoustic sensor or microphone and uses those frequencies of sound, together with machine learning algorithms, to figure out the touch type. It's very, very low cost and very easy to add to a phone. OK, so that's a quick overview of touch tools and fingersets, both of which aim to enhance touch interaction by making better use of the rich dimensions of our hands. So let's return to the other problem I highlighted earlier in my talk. Screens are limited in size. So how do we break interaction free from small screens and displays? One very promising interaction is to let interaction spill out onto the world around us. Unlike mobile devices, the world around us is pretty huge, full of unused surface area, such as tables, doors, chairs, walls, newspapers, and books. So what would happen if we could use all of that space for interactive purposes? And that's exactly the question I asked myself when I began working on a project called WorldKit. With WorldKit, users quite literally paint interfaces right onto their world. So with a quick swipe of your hand, interfaces can be positioned and sized by users, creating a custom interface which could be saved for future use. Here, I'm making basically a status message system for my office. I even put a sensor on the door to sense if it's open or closed, all without any wires, an interface directly on my world. So here's another example. It's a simple recipe helper in my kitchen. WorldKit actually tells me which ingredients I still need and counts off the ingredients I already have. WorldKit can also be used as a simple app launcher for the world. When I touch the table, WorldKit highlights the surface. I then launch a music app. Now I can touch the, the pillow next to me. You can see I swipe over to the light switch, which controls the lights in my room. I could paint that light switch anywhere I wanted. I could remodel the house with just a swipe of my hand. So currently, WorldKit looks like this. It's a typical projector on the bottom and a depth camera on top. The depth camera is like, kind of like a normal camera, but it takes a continuous video of the surroundings. Unlike a normal camera, it can tell how far away each pixel is from the sensor. Basically, it senses the 3D surface of the environment. Both of these components are, com are mass-produced commercially, so they can be bought at pretty low cost. So let's have a quick look at how this system actually works. WorldKit figures out where all the surfaces are in the environment. Here you can see each surface labeled with its surface area. WorldKit uses the positions and orientations of the surfaces to detect touches. Here I've set up WorldKit to show you how it actually works. On the right side, we have the WorldKit projector. And on the left, you can see the projected interface. You can see here that WorldKit is actually projecting at an angle. This is a sample of what the depth camera actually sees. The background surfaces here are all shown as green. And you see when I touch, you see blue. That means a detected touch. And this is what the projector is actually projecting at. You'll see it's actually pretty distorted. It's because WorldKit's projecting at an angle. So in order to get the imagery to appear correct on the surface, we have to distort it like this so it looks like this on the table. WorldKit uses the knowledge of its surfaces to generate correct imagery on any surface anywhere in your world. It can operate on any number of surfaces, which makes it ideal for your real world that has many distinct surfaces and different angles. All right, so let's go back to the hardware. This system right now is a bit too big to be deployed widely. This isn't something you'd comfortably want in your home, kitchen, or bedroom. But this could be about to change soon. While the projector used in this project is quite sizable, new Pico projectors coming out now could be pretty small. This tiny little projector puts out the same resolution as our big projector, but in one one-thousandth of the volume. The major limitation, though, is that these little projectors aren't very bright yet. But even that could change soon. Lighting efficiencies have been increasing lately. There's one trend, though, that I really want to point out. LEDs have recently begun to make incredible advances in lighting efficiency, increasing tenfold in brightness and light output over the last decade. This means they're not only brighter, but also more power efficient, eliminating the need for fans and heat sinks. So what does that all mean? 
small, bright projectors are right on the horizon. The second component of WorldKit, the depth camera, is also going to shrink quite substantially over the next uh, few years. For example, in the last 10 years, we've seen regular cameras shrink for considerably. The tiny little camera module from the Samsung smartphone packs four times as many pixels as the huge camera on the left. And so, in the next decade, we should expect our depth cameras to likewise shrink. Indeed, some of the newest depth cameras available now are already getting pretty small. So, where does all of that miniaturization take us? What might WorldKit on world interfaces look like in five years? It might look like a light bulb. Here's a prototype I built with the smallest components I could get today. It's a complete computer and WorldKit system. It's got a power source, a processor, a projector, and a depth camera. But this one costs about $1,000. If you trust, though, in the trends that I showed you throughout my presentation, this will be half the size, 10 times as powerful, and a fraction of the cost in just a few years' time. So imagine this, what I just showed you, as the light bulb of the future. Instead of a dumb filament, we have a smart projector. Instead of just light, we have interactivity. Instead of just illuminating our rooms, we now have light that empowers us. Computers will not just be boxes that sit under our tables, but instead will inhabit a world infused with information. So, from rich touch to information on our world and onwards to interactive light, the future of interaction is bright indeed. Thank you. <laughs>